St. Anne's Home is a non-government organization under the patronage of the Archbishop of the Church of the Province of South Africa. Located in Woodstock, near Cape Town, the St. Anne's Shelter has been helping women for over 112 years. St. Anne's came about when a group of people from the Anglican Church worked together to obtain a house for women or girls in need. The demand grew and, and larger, more suitable premises were required. Thus, a new home on the same site in Chapel Street, Woodstock, was erected to accommodate 25 women. Our journalist Lenina Rasul recently sat down with Joy Lang, director of St. Anne's Shelter, to chat about the shelter services they offer victims of domestic violence. Let's take a look. Let's start with telling us a bit more about the services that are provided and what that is in relation to the minimum standards. Is it actually way above what yeah. those standards are? Um, St. Anne's being 113 years old is sort of way above, I can say that from the onset, is way above the minimum standards. So for example, when a woman um, is in a, an abusive relationship and she ends up at our front gate, most cases women come with nothing or minimal because in some, some cases they are actually fleeing the abusive mm -hmm. environment. So when that woman comes with nothing, it starts from um, clothing her, looking at what, what her basic needs are. And that um, we normally have a care pack. So it's not just for the mother, it's for her children um, as well. Um, and then there's of course the clothing. Um, we as St. Anne's provide three meals per day. Um, we have a social work department, we have a Chris children's program as well. So the mother, um, would be seen to via our social worker and our social auxiliary worker um, with regards to uh, psychosocial support, one-on-one -on -one counselling and then also the empowerment program. So we have a very um, robust empowerment program which looks at anything from soft skills to hard skills and when I say soft skills, um, for example, we run the healing and restoration program which is a 11-week program we run um, positive parenting training for the mother as well. We have job readiness, which looks at a broad range from everything that must be on your CV, right through to how to present yourself in an interview, how to search for a job, you know, all, all those kinds of things. We have a computer literacy room where uh, PC literacy skills are being taught. Um, there are other therapeutic interventions, um, they do crafting and various types of things with regards to crafting. Um, they get taught how to do, um, we use recycled wax and we make candles which can then be sold. Um, there's sewing um, and of course there's also the self-esteem building um, of the woman. Uh, there's group therapy sessions which is quite powerful because the women learn from each other because they also understand that they they, they might be different in terms of um, culture and that sort of thing, but they have the same story to tell and so they can learn from each other through that. So we also facilitate that. Then we have a job placement program as well where we engage various uh, businesses and they then um, uh, we find, try and find work for, for our women. Uh, for example, um, we uh, work with, network with various um, hotels in the hospitality industry. So, but then obviously with the funding that comes from uh, DSD, from the Department of Social Development, you're funded based on the minimum standards and the rest of the, the, rest of the stuff you have to find funding for yourself. Yeah. on the current funding model? Yeah, yeah. the current okay. funding model, I mean, there are, there are 17 uh, shelters in the Western Cape, mm -hmm. women's shelters, and of which I think about 11 or 12 um, get funding from the department. And so the, the, the nice thing about um, the relationship that we have with the Department of Social Development in the province and the shelter movement, mm -hmm. because we also a Western Cape shelter movement, we formed um, that body. Um, is that we all get the same amount of money. So okay. it's 49 rand per day um, per bed. 
that we okay. get funding for. Can you tell us, uh, I was interested to read about the per bed model, mm. uh, especially when you, th to me it almost seems like that is a model that's more for a homeless shelter in terms of what they provide, which is the bed and possibly yes. the meal. Uh, is it sufficient for women shelters given not given the services that needs to be provided? Not sufficient at all. I mean, if you take 49 rand mm. and you look at um, just the portion, what portion you would give, allocate to food, mm. um, to toiletries, mm. uh, to electricity, mm. uh, which is a huge... Um, cost when mm -hmm. you're running a shelter. Uh, the month for the month of between August and September, I think, our, just for the premises, our electricity bill was between six and eight thousand rand at all. Yeah. You know, uh, in terms of the monthly uh, expenses. Yes. Uh, to, for example, operate, our monthly expense is around a hundred and it hovers between a hundred and thirty and a hundred and fifty thousand. A month, mm. um, and that is if a geezer doesn't burst mm. or yes. the car doesn't With break down, unexpected, you know, all the unexpected yes. things. So, yeah, and um, to provide quality care and service, um, you need uh, to be able to um, have the necessary funding mm. um, in order to support women and children as they journey through, because it's very difficult to step into a shelter and still to, to, to understand like what's happening mm -hmm. with me or when you are going through a divorce as well. Because mm -hmm. it's not just the roof and the bed. Yes. It's that emotional support. It's yes. that support in terms of going to the court. Because it's daunting. I mean, uh, I often say um, the worst thing for me is when a mother comes in and um, she's been in an abusive uh, relationship and uh, she's pregnant. Mm -hmm. And so having to deal with the separation and the enormity of a relationship that is not working and having to still deal with the fact that I'm pregnant and I'm going to have a baby soon and then going off and having this baby all on your own, mm. you know, it, it, it's, it's just not right for me that um, any woman should go through and experience that because mm. the birth of a child, bringing a child into to the world is such a... A privilege and such a joyous um, experience and occasion and it should rightfully be that yes. and so we try by all means to um, support the women and we have a wonderful relationship with um, Mowbray Maternity mm -hmm. where they really um, give the women the love and support and the care uh, in addition to you know understanding where, yes. where, where they come from in terms of you were speaking about earlier, it takes long with this sort of issue with the gender violence and empowering women. Mm -hmm. It takes longer to see that impact, yes. sometimes five years. Mm -hmm. And so, th is this a barrier to funding in that they want to, they are not able to measure uh, more quickly that it's, you know, that that investment has been worth it, so to speak? It is. I would say that it is a barrier. And then I would also say that, um, on the other hand, there's also the thing of patriarchy um, that also comes, steps in, in terms of um, violence against women and children, I mean, is an age-old story. And so, for example, mm. St. Anne's is 113 years old. We should be working towards closing shelters and not needing more shelters. Mm. And so... Um, as a society, violence against women is, is almost become like it's not been normalized. Mm. Um, and as a result, um, when these heinous crimes happen against children and women, um, it's, it's sort of just another number. Mm. You know, and I've gone and I, I name uh, the women. Mm. You know, because you don't want to forget it was a person. So it doesn't just have to become another statistic, which is what it has become. Mm. And um, the big challenge for me is the fact that our government has not moved to um, getting legislation in place for mm. um, victim empowerment, mm. because we get funding under that category within um, the Department of Social Development. So there is no uh, legislation that governs that, which means that 
um, we become the stepchildren yes. of, um, when you look at the broader context of um, the Department of Social Development and all the programs that they run. Mm. And so you get the smallest piece of the pie mm. um, when you look at the funding allocations because there is no um, legislation that governs that. Mm -hmm. and, and you will often hear that people speak about the fact that there is no legislation so people can just thumb suck and as a result um, if you look at the, the, the country and the various provinces this is why um, provincial governments can give whatever they feel yes. is necessary um, and for, for, for me I find that um, hugely challenging because a survivor with a, a, a woman with her children who have been survivors of um, intimate partner violence in whatever province is the same um, and should be mm. essentially be getting the same um, level of services across the board. Did you know one in five women are victims of gender-based violence and that South Africa has the highest femicide rate in the world? In this insert, Lenina Rasul chats to Claudia Lopez and Joy Watson about a policy brief for women's shelters. They interrogate issues around the number of shelters available nationwide and whether they meet demand. Let's have a look. Can you explain the difference between homeless shelters and shelters that were looked at during your research for this policy brief, um, just so that the audience understands the distinction. So the, our focus of the research was looking at shelters for abused women. Essentially, they're actually shelters for victims of crime and violence. Um, but our specific focus was on women who have left abusive relationships, so women that, were, that had experienced intimate partner violence. Um, and shelters for abused women and other victims of crime and violence are very different to homeless shelters. Those uh, homeless shelters cater for those, um, cater for people that are living on the streets, um, and it's a, a space for them to reside in a temporary accommodation. Um, and shelters is, is quite different. It's, it's, a, it's a safe space for women to find reprieve from the violence that existed. There's longer term accommodation from say three to six months, longer sometimes depending on the needs. Um, and they offer a variety of services for women to try and help them heal and also uh, look to a better future. Um, and then just looking at how many shelters are there in South Africa? And is this number sufficient compared to how many people need it? Um, there's, according to government, there are 84 shelters nationwide. Um, we have partnered with the National Shelter Movement of South Africa, and on the National Shelter Movement's uh, database, we have about 71 shelters on the database. So not everyone is a member of the National Shelter Movement, but a large portion of shelters are. And it's difficult to determine the exact number of shelters that exist. Shelters open, shelters close, due to often due to lack of funding. Um, and there's also different types of shelters. Um, so it's difficult to gauge to what extent the 84 are long-term shelters. Um, and also to determine, it's difficult to determine the need for these shelters because we have, uh, in South Africa, for example, we have very limited information in terms of statistics on violence against women is often underreported. Um, police don't, dese don't desegregate information in terms of domestic violence, say, specifically. So to try and determine the need versus um, the capacity of shelters is, is difficult to determine. However, what I can say is um, that, say, for example, shelters in the Western Cape are often full to capacity and there are actually waiting lists. Um, some as, as much as uh, three months waiting lists. It depends, or four, uh, f about 40 women on a waiting list at, every, at any given time. So there's definitely, I mean, there's a, that's another component of research that we are undertaking in two different provinces in Eastern Cape and Northern Cape. So try and determine what is the need for, for shelters, considering that in some provinces there really are very limited shelters. Northwest, for example, there's only one shelter. In the Northern Cape, there's about three shelters. There used to be more. These, again, closed down due to lack of funding. So I, I think there's definitely a need for, for more shelters, but there's, what you also need to understand is 
there's sometimes stigma also associated with um, being in abusive relationships and seeking shelter. There's family pressures to remain in an abusive relationship or to try and make a relationship work. So there's various factors um, why perhaps some women are not seeking shelters and other, in other situations where women are very desperate and there just is no facilities or are no facilities for those women. So how are shelters currently funded and what are the main sh services that you find they are struggling to maintain or find funding for? So again, it, it varies from, from shelter to shelter. Um, there are shelters that in, are entirely dependent on um, funding from the Department of Social Development. Um, in 2011, uh, the Department of Social Development changed the funding model and in terms of this new approach, shelters were required to fill the, um, to, to fundraise to fill their funding gaps. So m mostly it is um, through uh, subsidization by the Department of Social Development and um, their own fundraising initiatives. However, I think the difficulty is that, uh, you know, when one looks at the way the Domestic Violence Act is worded, it talks about the provision of shelter services without talking about whose responsibility it is to fund um, shelters. But then we look at other uh, policy provisions, the minimum standards in shelters and also the national strategy. And, you know, certainly within um, these policy uh, frameworks, there is a responsibility on the department to provide these, these services. So, uh, you know, we're sitting with a, a situation where um, as much as that funding approach has changed so that shelters themselves have to do the fundraising, <coughs> in reality, um, it's not quite working out and most of them, um, the bulk majority have had moments of great um, crisis um, that, they've had, that they have had to deal, deal with, which has affected how they provide services in some instances. So I think that this is essentially the most important point that we want to make, the, that um, the funding model is not working as it should. Uh, these NGOs are in distress, or have, have had moments of distress and crisis. And